So a uh, couple weeks ago, we were on vacation, on vacation a couple weeks ago with my family, and uh, for those of you who don't know, we were in Maine with my, my grandparents have a cottage there. They've lived in Maine my whole life, and so they've had this cottage my entire life, and so it's kind of like a family tradition that I've kept on now that I have my own family, that we go back there once a year, and uh, my parents will meet us there, and the cottage has gotten too small for all the family to show up at the same time, but we got a little overlap with some of my sisters and, and some, of my, uh, some of the cousins and things like that, so that was fun, and we had a good time there. But while we were there, we, uh, we noticed something as we took a, the kids like to take boat rides around, around the lake, so we would take them putting around in the boat, boat around the lake, and as Holland and I were kind of driving around, what we noticed is, as, and what we found out later after we talked to my grandparents, is they told us kind of this, this big storm came through. This big storm came through their area, and so there was a lot of cottages, either some of them that had tarps in specific places to kind of cover up where tree branches had fallen or things had been broken or... Uh, there was one couple back in the, in the cove of the lake that had already started rebuilding, and they were building, I mean, cottages on lakes from even when I was a kid. The cottage that we used to have was just a, you know, it was like an A-frame, and there was, there was no internet. There was no even TVs when I first grew up. And then we go to this cottage in the back, and it's just windows all the way up. It's like three stories. It looks like a townhome you'd see downtown Chicago, but on a lake. It's like amazing what counts as like a cottage now, you know? But... They took this opportunity. They said, yeah, my grandparents thought this huge storm came through, a bunch of tree branches found down, knocked things down, and the people took the opportunity who had kind of maybe older or broken down cabins. They said, all right, we already wanted to do some things, but this is a good opportunity. We'll take some of the insurance money. We'll do some of these, and we'll build something brand new. And so you saw that around the lake. You saw these different little places that people had been affected by the storm and decided, hey, we're going to rebuild. And that's the thing. This, there's this balance there between what is broken to what is new. There's this balance between like, oh, hey, it's when you first hear something breaks, that's almost like you, it's, a, it's a dread moment. It's like, a, oh, man, now I've got to replace it or now I've got to fix it or now I've got to. But then there's also a moment sometimes where that sets in where it's like, ooh, something new, you know? There was a couple weeks ago where uh, I was at work and Holland called me and, and she's like, hey, like the washing machine is not draining and it's making some funny sounds. And at first you're like, oh man, oh, the washing machine. It's, it's already, you know, it's, it's like the leftover piece from the couple that was there before us. And you're like, oh, it's somebody else's washing machine. Like you clean it the best you can, but it's like somebody else's washing machine. Like there was a moment where it's like, oh crap, like I don't want to, I don't want to have to do a new washing machine, but then there's like a, but, you know, you start sending each other pictures. You're like, this one's kind of nice, you know? <laughs> And then you start thinking about what's new, and then the dang thing fixes itself, and it's fine again, you know? And then you're stuck. You're like, oh, man, I thought I had an opportunity there for a moment, but it's all good. Yeah, it's fine. We'll just keep the clunky. Uh, anyway, there's, there's this balance. There's this tenuous balance between when something breaks, this sinking feeling of like, oh, man, it stinks that something is broken, between the opportunity with like what's new, what's coming next, what's the... What's the opportunity that maybe lies beyond that? What's the restoration? What's the rebuild that happens? And really, we're talking about this morning, the title of our message is One Day, the New Heaven and the New Earth. And it's fitting that we get to the end of Isaiah and we look forward. Isaiah gets this opportunity to look forward to what's to come. Because really, when we talk about rebuilding, the one day, the new heaven and the new earth, the day when the Lord fixes all that has been broken, that is the ultimate time, that is the ultimate moment of rebuilding. That is the ultimate moment of fixing what was broken, of restoring what has been made just destroyed by sin. This is the opportunity that God has. And the thing that I want us to kind of think about and take away from this is that for God's people, eternity, that one day, is going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible. And I say that, I make this the point, the key idea for today, because I think there's still something built into each and every one of us. And I don't blame you for this. I feel this at certain points. I feel this at certain times. It was part of my, my story growing up and, and growing up in a Christian home and hearing about all these different things is that there was also, as much as there's this excitement and this incredibleness about what it's going to be like to one day be with God, I'm sure maybe for some of you, maybe not in a long time, maybe it was when you were younger, but maybe even still now, there's, there's still a, a, a pit of you that feels like, hey, there's also 
When there's uncertainty, there can be fear. There can be, what is this going to look like? Am I going to, am I going to like it? Is it going to be enjoyable? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be everything every, you know, every Christian, every pastor, every church ever said, like, can't wait, can't wait to get to heaven, but what does that mean? What does it really mean to, to be in eternity with God forever? What does that look like? And I hope to show you this morning that I believe, even from the things we're going to read today, eternity with God for his people is going to be incredible. It is not something that we fear or we wonder or we say, oh God, I, I don't know if I want to do this. It's something that we can have the attitude like Paul had, which where he said, to live is Christ, but to die is gain because I get to be with God. So I want to look at that with you this morning. The first thing that I want us to see together from Isaiah 65, at the beginning of the passage, we see eternity is with, with God is only for his people. Eternity with God is only for his people. If we look at some of the beginning of Psalm 65, it says in verse 1, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and who spend the night in secret places, eating pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself and do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are the people that God is dealing with. These are the people that they are in rebellion against God. They're rebelling against what he's doing. And this is the undercurrent of everything that we're talking about and we have been talking about throughout the entirety of Isaiah 65 is that the undercurrent here is that this, this passage is written to a people living in exile because of the sins that they committed against God, because of the way that they turned from God and decided to go after their own pleasures and their own desires. And God has given them up to these things. They are now in exile because God has given them up to their devices. God has given them up to their desires. And so that's where we see them. That's where we see that they, they, they find themselves. In verse 9, it says, I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. Down in verse 12, it says, I will destine you to the sword and all of you who bow down to the slaughter because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen, but you did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. God is telling, we're seeing that there is these two groups of people and this is true for eternity one day, church. There's this undercurrent, there's this group of people that think to themselves and it's called universalism that thinks everything works out in the end. Everybody gets into heaven. Everybody gets the opportunity to go to heaven. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, God loves you so much that just like, you know, you get to go to heaven and you get to go to heaven. You know, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Everybody wins. And that's from the Bible, from, from biblical truth, not from what we want to be true or what we think in our own feelings. From what the Bible tells us, that is not the case. We see here in this passage that God is dividing them and saying to them, these are the people that have chosen, that have been called by my name. These are the people that are following me. You see over here, these are people who have rejected, who have chosen to go their own way, who have chosen sin. In Matthew 25, in Matthew, it tells us that there is, Jesus actually gives us a parable about this. He actually gives us a parable about these things in Matthew 25, 41 to 46, it's called the parable of the sheep and the goats. Don't have time this morning to turn there, but you go read it yourself this week. There's this passage talking about the fact that there comes a time and there comes a day and an opportunity where people will choose and decide to reject God and to reject his message. And he talks about how the sheep are the ones that enter into his rest, that enter into his into the place into heaven, into eternity with him. And the goats are the one that chose to reject God and they will spend eternity separated from him. This is the reality of what the Bible tells us, church. It's not, eternity with God is only for his people. 
not everybody gets the opportunity to be with God forever. And that's why God has placed us here as his ambassadors, as his emissaries, to go and to tell and to give people the opportunity to respond to the message, to give people the opportunity to say that, yes, I accept, or yes, I reject, at least the opportunity to hear the message of the hope of Jesus Christ and that he died on the cross for their sins. Because one day, eternity is real. There is eternity with God or eternity separated from God. But eternity with God is only for his people. There is not a everybody gets in. And so this passage is written to people who are living in exile and this promise that those people in exile will one day, they have the hope of rebuilding. They have the hope that things are going to get rebuilt. And I think that's beautiful that this is written to people living in exile because I think, and I think you probably feel with me because I feel this, and I hope you feel this sometimes too, we feel like I'm living in exile here where we're at right now. Not just in Elmhurst, not just in this city or in this, you know, in this uh, country or in this world, in, in, in this just this place as a whole amongst the people around us that sometimes you have this feeling like, man, God, I, I feel like, am I, am I taking crazy pills? How do, how do people see this so differently than me? How do people see these things? How are they not seeing the truth that's right here in front of them? It's because this is not our home. This is not where our citizenship is placed. Just like the people of Israel living in exile in Babylon, as Christians, you are technically living in exile here, in Elmhurst, in America, as much as this is our country, that you're still, this is not your home forever. It's just temporary. It's just for now. That's what Philippians tells us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a savior there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. One day, our citizenship is not here. And so when you feel like, man, I feel like out of place or this doesn't make sense, or that's because the spiritual part of you, the eternal part of you, your soul is longing to be with your Savior where you're intended and supposed to be. It's good that you long and look forward to these things. It's good that you long and look forward to when things are made right and perfect and good because that's what your deepest desires are and that will never be fulfilled here. That will never be matched here that will never be lived up to here. And so then, if that's what eternity is for God's people, if we as his people, if that's what we're longing for, then let's get a glimpse of what this new heaven and new earth is gonna look like. The first thing we see is number two, that the new is needed because the old is corrupted. If you look with me in chapter 65 and verse 17, it says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. God declares it right there. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. The former things are not remembered any longer because they are corrupted and they are broken. They have been corrupted and they have been broken since the time of Adam and Eve. Since Adam and Eve first brought sin into this world, we have corrupted and broken this earth and none of us have done any better. Just as Adam and Eve corrupted it with their sin, we continue to corrupt the earth with our sin and our brokenness. This perfect creation that God designed was broken and corrupted by sin. When people ask what they think is, you know, the, the hardest question anybody can ask a Christian is why does evil happen or why do bad things happen? I tell them, don't, don't look to God, look at yourself. Look at us, look at humans, and look at the decisions that we have made. Look at how we are selfish and prideful 
and greedy and judgmental and lustful. We are a people who bring these things upon ourselves, who have decided all the way back to Adam and Eve, each and every one of us when we're born chooses that brokenness of sin over the goodness of God that he created us for. And so by that, brokenness enters into this sinful world. And so why then do bad things happen? Why does God allow these things? Partly there's still part of me that doesn't understand the plans that God is working through. We talked about this last week, right? His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. And so I will never fully understand. And then there's parts of things that I can look at in my own life and say, Sam, you did that. You chose that. You chose to make these decisions. You chose to put into these things. You chose not to do the right things. You chose, those were because of the decisions that you made. That's why, and ultimately the beautiful thing is that God just doesn't, when Jesus comes into my life and he redeems it and he makes it all brand new, there's also the future promise that one day I will be in complete and total perfection. No more corruptedness, no more brokenness. That's why the new is needed because the old is corrupted. And then think about the fact that the old is corrupted. Think about how great that makes the new. How awesome that means the new is going to be. I tell this to, to uh, the group of students I was teaching a few weeks ago at camp. We were talking a little bit about heaven and the future. And I, I want you guys to do the same thing. Think about, we, we all admit this world is broken, it is corrupted, it has sin in it. Now think about the place in this world that makes you feel the happiest or the people that you're around that makes you feel the happiest. Think of those moments. For, for me, I think, I think back to the lake in Maine, some of my best memories there. Think about the lake you grew up going to. Think about your parents' house growing up. Think about the vacation, the best vacation you've ever taken. Think about the golf course where you hit that hole in one. Think about the, you know, think about the boat that you love to fish on. Think about the, the, the spa that you, I don't care, whatever it is. Think about all the, the best moments, the best places that this world has to offer. The, <laughs> the Redwoods room in the back when Mark's just really giving it to everybody. That's, that's, that's David's happy place. Think about that and think about the beauty that this, this is a corrupted and broken world. And then when you think there is new to come, think about the best place, the best time you could have here on earth and then multiply it by a million, a billion, a number that's too big to quantify. And I think, why would I be afraid of the new that's to come? Because if a God who loves me so much can give me that beauty and that love and that joy in this broken world, can he not give me 10 times that in a world that is perfect and without sin? That's what we have to look forward to one day. We get to live in that. Let's talk about heaven and eternity like that, church. Let's look forward to it like that. Because I think sometimes we do so much in and of ourselves to diminish the future that God has for us because we think of it like it, we were told it, it was gonna be like some boring church service where we just sit and we can't get Nathaniel to stop singing. We just are stuck in a time loop forever, right? I'm just kidding, that's heaven right there. Just listening to Nathaniel forever, right? That's right, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> that's... The beauty, the best we can imagine here is a shadow, a pale comparison of what God can offer us one day. That's why it's good to look at the old and how corrupted it is because God can even offer us some shred of beauty here. And then when we see that, that should draw our mind to, oh Lord, how much better will that be one day when I am with you and everything is perfect and made right. Oh, I'm excited for that. I look forward for that because that's going to be incredible. And then he gives, he is even more gracious to us in the chapter. What will the new look like? What are some glimpses of the newness that we can see? Here's just a couple that he shows to us. Verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. 
and no more shall be heard the sounds of weeping or the cry of distress. No more weeping, no more distress, no more tears over any of these things in our, that are going on in our lives. No more tears over pain, no more tears over difficult and hard situations. There will be no more weeping, no more distress. God will make all of those things right. And there are things in all of our lives that we think back on, that we come to the time of, and just causes tears to well up. Whether there's a date that we lost a loved one, whether there was a, a moment in time that we know we can never take back or never get back. There's things that cause us all to weep and to cry and feel that distress. And God promises us one day in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be none of that. In verse 20, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die at 100 years old, and the sinner 100 years old shall be accursed. No more tragedy. No more kids being taken before they should. No more people not living out the fullness and the completeness of their days. No more, this, this verse is initially a promise to the people coming back that, that, you know, there were infants that were dying too early. There was people who were killed in battle. There were things. The promise to them is when you come back to Jerusalem, I will restore all these things. And it's also a promise of a restoration that will be in the new heaven and the new earth where there will be no more death, period. There will be no more anybody who dies before their time. No one who dies before they are supposed to. There will be no more death, period. No more tragedy of the things that we have to face. In verses 21 and 22, it says, They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall be the days of my people, and my chosen shall long enjoy the long work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children in calamity tells us that in the new heaven and the new earth, first to the exiles, when they come back, look, you, don't, you won't have to share Jerusalem with the Babylonians anymore, with the Assyrians anymore. You will not labor in vain for somebody else. Probably in Babylon, they were working for a place that they did not own. They were working for a master's and did not get to enjoy the full fruits of their labor. One day, we will be in the new heaven and the new earth, and we nothing we do will be in vain any longer. It won't be pointless. It won't lead to nothing. I, one thing I, I think about a lot of the times when it comes to the new heaven and the new earth, do you realize that there will probably be work to do there? Because work is good. Work is good. Work before work was designed for Adam, work did not come as a result of the fall. It was there before the fall because he designed us. And for those of you who enjoy what you do, I I am blessed to be called one among them. I'm, I won't need to be a pastor anymore. We'll be perfect. You guys won't have any sins for me to fix. But um, just, just kidding. But that I'll find something else to fulfill the works of my hands, and it will not be in vain. We will get to enjoy the full fruits of it. When we were left on vacation, we left our, our flowers in the capable hands of David Boda, and, uh, and he... We came back, they were way better than when we left, and now they're worse since we've been back. So sorry, David, uh, the work of your hands were in vain for us. Uh, but one day, David will get to plant the gardens and enjoy the fruit of the flowers and get to enjoy the fullness of that with no more weeds and no more thorns and thistles and the fullness of, of the work of our hands will be beautiful. There will be no more laboring in vain. That's what the beauty of eternity has to offer us. And then finally in verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Even the creatures will be transformed in the new heaven and the new earth in eternity together. All of creation will be transformed even down to the creatures that walk the earth and there will be no more sin, and there will be no more death, and there will be no more brokenness. None of the things that break our hearts here will happen there. 
And church, that should be a comfort. I hope, I pray that is a comfort for you. Because I know that there are those of you out there who are like, why, God, I've been in pain for the last three months. What are you doing? Or I've been dealing with this issue. I can, I can guarantee you that there are people in this room who are wondering why, why this, this hurts, this is hard, this is difficult. And maybe the small comfort that can be given is that one day God is going to take away all of that pain and maybe, just maybe, I don't know what God's specifically doing in each and every one of your lives, but maybe that is supposed to give you a picture of what you have to look forward to. That maybe that is supposed to increase in you the hope of what you will have one day with God. And how beautiful and how wonderful. And I know that when there are people who are hurting or going through those things, what I want them to know and what we try to proclaim over them, that's why prayer is not an empty thing to do when someone is hurting or going through pain because there is power in prayer and there is power in Jesus' name and prayer helps to reorient our minds to say we look to God in the midst of what we're going through and we see hope. We see hope in the midst of that. And that's what fills this passage, hope. Hope is in every page and every word because when we look forward to eternity, that's what we see. We see the hope of what God has for us. And it's so cool to me. This book, Isaiah, is written before the time of Christ. It's written hundreds of years before one day John will be shipwrecked on the island of Patmos and write the book of Revelation. And yet, if you look at Revelation chapter 21 that talks a little bit about the new heaven and the new earth, John confirms everything that Isaiah is saying here in this passage. In verse 19 of Revelation 21, he talks about how there will be no more tears, how there will be no more grief and no more crying. In verse 24, he talks about how there God will be with us. And he also talks about how this new heaven and new earth is separated for those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's not for everyone. It's for those who Jesus and God calls and who chooses to follow the Lord and decides to choose to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This hope, church, should push us forward to look forward to what God has for us in eternity. We are a people with a great hope of what is to come. I'm so excited for that. Last thing we have over here. Oh, <laughs> you have to forgive me. I uh, did this presentation earlier in the week, and I must have written down in my notes and never actually copied it onto. So I will say it instead of, what is the action to take? Hey, well, Sam, why don't you tell us? Uh, why don't you put it up on the screen where it belongs? What is the action to take? I wanted you to, to, to go this week. I was going to write, as I just referenced Revelation 21, if you want to look forward to what the hope is, please Sometime this week, find time to read Revelation 21. Go and open your Bible to the book of Revelation and read about what our future hope is. There's a lot in Revelation that leads up to that, but don't concern yourself with that for this week. Just go and read and and be instilled with the beauty of what God has for you as his people this week. If there's a prayer to pray, we ask the Lord, Lord, please instill the hope of eternity on my heart. I just, uh, it was perfect timing because just talking to somebody during the greeting time and of course I'm not, you know, not embarrassing anybody, I hope they don't mind me sharing, but just a person going through some difficult things and saying, but I'm just asking the Lord and giving it to him and giving him that. And that, when we have our hope in eternity, that's what we do. We give the things that we're dealing with, the things that we're struggling with, the things that we're going through. We're saying, Lord, please take all of these things and instead fill my heart with the hope of eternity. So, Lord, if there's a prayer to pray, please fill my heart with the hope of eternity. And if there's a praise to repeat, it's thank you, Lord, that you will rebuild, that you will fix what is broken. Because that's the other solution to living as we are not citizens in this place. We can look at it and we can do our best. Okay, that doesn't excuse us from responsibility. We should do the best that we can here to make Elmhurst, to make the United States, to make our world 
We should do our best to bring the hope of Jesus Christ into this place. But when they don't accept, when they don't respond, when they don't listen, we can still step back and say, God, that's okay because you are going to rebuild all of this. One day, in if the book of Revelation talks about it, if you think of it in terms of my analogy with the main cabins, one day revelation is going to happen, and that is one big tree that is going to come crashing down on this house, and God is saying, I sent that tree, and now it's time for me to rebuild. Thank you, Lord, that one day you'll rebuild this and make it all right.